Hey everybody, Jazzy here. Welcome to the recap for year three of Merm on the Moon, my solo Wirt series over on Twitch. The first two years were focused on bosses, and now before the onslaught of Rift content gets fired up, I do want to spend some time gathering resources and getting started on a proper base. Now, this is a weird point in any world, and I suspect it's the moment where the majority of experienced players end their run. You've been going boss to boss for years, then all of a sudden you have all the boss drops. What do you do now? It's a really crystallized moment where suddenly I am charged with choosing my own goals. And I gotta do it fast, otherwise I just lose interest in the world. So I need to start building as soon as possible. There's so many builds that we could start with and there's no real science to choosing what comes first. But for me, what really helps define a base is to start with some sort of large centerpiece build. You know, the beating heart of your base. Functionally, it could be anything. It could be a kitchen, an animal pen, a farm, or it could also be purely decorative. I find that generally speaking, the function that I urgently need at this point in the game is item storage and crafting. So Wirt's centerpiece build is going to be a sprawling chest zone. We'll get to more of the method in a bit, but for now, let's pick back up with Wirt in autumn. First thing I need to do is start moving stuff over to the new base location. So I'm gonna make a trident and uproot all of the kelp I planted in the swamp so I can transfer it to the new biome. If you use a construction amulet, you only need two narwhal horns. And if you deconstruct a trident before it hits 33%, you get two of the horns back. So as long as you're vigilant, you will never need to harvest more than two narwhal horns. For base location, I'm going with the oasis for the reasons I mentioned in year one. Obviously wildfire protection, but also great proximity to important places such as the oasis, dragonfly, the portal, the swamp, the moonstone, and a couple wormholes that take us all the way across the world. The swamp doesn't offer too many immovable resources for Wirt. Reeds and Merm houses are important early on, but eventually we'll be making our own, so I'm not at all married to the swamp at this point. Now I'm generally safe leaving items on sandy turf. Eye plants don't spawn on it, so we're safe from lure plants. I'll place a lightning rod nearby for protection so the items are actually quite safe. I do need to watch out for buzzards, which will eat practically anything edible I leave on the ground. So I'm gonna make a temporary chest for storing items such as rot, pig skin, glomer goop, mandrakes, guardian horns, and deer clops eyeballs. Hey, remember when Shadow Chester died and I lost all my stuff for like a whole season? Yeah, so. I left Chester to play with some spiders and they didn't play nicely. I only have to wait like three days to get him back, but look at all the loot that he just took away with him. I was actually reminded of one advantage of Shadow Chester in this situation, that if the thing that kills him happens to eat consumable stuff, the items will still be safe. We have a hound fortress in the oasis and I'm gonna bring the merm guards through and knock down all the mounds. If this had spawned anywhere else, I may have considered keeping it around for meat and teeth farming, but Honestly, Wirt doesn't really need monster meat, but I do need that precious desert land. I also figured since I had the merms, I could have them clear some of the spider dens in the nearby quarry biome. Generally, it's helpful to keep followers focused on a single target at a time, but if they do start to split up and go for different mobs, you can always run away to gather them back to you and then run back in to refocus their attacks. Another important thing we are going to do with merms is farm scales at Dragonfly so that we can make lots of scaled chests. Now, we could kill Dragonfly, but I'm going to use Merms to stun her, and then try to get enough damage to make her drop a scale, at which point I run away to gather the Merms back and despawn the boss. Then we can go back in and do the same thing again. Sometimes I prefer deconstructing scaled flooring for scales, but I don't have a ton of green gems available at this point. For large builds, I will make an overall outline of barren turf, and then I'll turf up the build itself when I'm happy with the shape. I highly recommend this setup for larger turfing jobs. Antlion hat with lazy forager on top of a beefalo. It will feel like painting the ground. Once we get the overall shape, I'm going to lay a few roads going through the middle of the build and form another smaller shape in the center. This is going to be a modular build, so I want everything to be more or less symmetrical. Bearger starts growling halfway through the season. I'm going to spawn him into the deciduous forest and have him knock down some trees. I'm gonna need as much wood as I can get, but I also always want to have plenty of birch nuts on hand. They are still one of the prettiest trees in the game, and I can only really gather a lot of them in autumn. After a day or so, I'm going to park Berger in the forest and let him live for a bit. Dude's gonna enjoy some peace, 
at least until the rifts turn on. It's the final day of autumn, and time to rock the sunfish. This will be the only cold management we will need for this run, and the fish will last like four days with wort, so we just swap it out when its spoilage gets low. Whenever possible, try to turf your builds completely before you start building. It's much less expensive than hammering and repositioning structures after building them. My idea for this zone is there's going to be an inner circle with scaled chests and an outer circle with regular chests. On the inner part, I'll put resources like gold, wood, rocks, and other crafting materials that I use more often. My first time in the archives, I only grabbed the astral detector, so I'm heading back to grab the rest of the blueprints, including the ancient stonework turf and the terra firma tamper. Now that I'm doing some serious building, it will be convenient to be able to craft up all the different natural turfs before cannibalizing turf from the world. I'm also going to stop by the ruins for a few supplies. To save a bit of gold, I'm going to deconstruct my low durability pickaxe and make a new one, and I will also grab a bit of thulacite so that I can make astral detectors for light. In winter, I'm fighting Kloss number 3 for some extra wax paper, and I also got an extra shroom skin. I haven't fought Misery Toad, so I'm not able to duplicate shroom skin yet, so any extra will be useful for making glow caps. As wort, I like to keep a bundle of sunfish in my inventory. Just in case I'm away from my base in winter, I can easily swap out fish whenever they get red. Then when I get back home, I can throw them all back into the tin bin. I've been saving up generic seeds throughout the year, and because Midsummer Carnival is currently enabled, I will stop by the portal and craft up some tree saplings for decoration, and the remaining seeds I'll turn into coins, just in case I want to play the games for additional decorations. The turfing for the chest zone is starting to come together. I'm using lush carpet for the scaled chests, carpeted flooring for the regular chests, and checkered flooring for the space in between, which will eventually have all of the crafting stations. Ornery Beeflow is a great way of dealing with hound waves at every stage of the game. Unless you get completely slammed with hounds, you can usually face tank most of them. I like to spawn them close to water because some of them will spawn in the water and you can kill some dogs before they all make it to shore. You can also run along water and occasionally they will jump into the water which will slow them down a bit and can help you manage larger numbers. I will prioritize special hounds first, then any varglets, and finally, the normal hounds. I'm gonna be a bit redundant with building alchemy engines and shadow manipulators. This will make prototyping more accessible all over the chest zone, and they also look great as decorations. In spring, I'm spending more time farming scales with merm guards. This time, I put a war saddle on the B-Flow for extra DPS, and I'm using an ice staff to fake attack Dragonfly, which will aggro the merms onto her and minimize the damage that my B-Flow takes. My B-Flow actually got low health the first time I did this, so I'm trying to manage its HP a little better this time. Nothing is more satisfying than sending a team of merm lawnmowers to mine out the entirety of the Hound Fortress and Wirt will appreciate the extra gold. Merm guards work just as well as regular merms for chopping and mining, so you won't see me using craft merms much outside of making a king. I also spent a few days finishing up the cleansing of the spider quarry, and I dare say we should absolutely be set on silk for a very long time. These guys make a mess, but they do it in style. I feel like I haven't praised Wirt enough. Look at this, 100% wetness, and who cares? Sunfish keeps us warm, no sanity loss, no slippery tools, nothing. Frog rain? Ignore it. This is Wirt's true power, an absolutely casual late game experience. The only seasonal danger that we really have to worry about is summer. And ice breams in the oasis will solve the problem of antlion, wildfires, and heat. Outside of that, with the sunfish every season is basically autumn. Take that thermal stones, take that umbrella. Merms reign supreme. I'm making a few ocean trawlers around the coastline. I'm not sure how well they will work, but I'm thinking that they may make for the occasional source of gold once we get a king in the desert. I can bait with monster meat because I don't have much else to use it for. I'm also sailing around the desert and I can use the trident to uproot some extra bull kelp to plant at my base. I can also use it to grab extra fish, but I'm not sure if it's gonna be easier than just fishing. The issue is if the fish don't land on my boat and fly back into the water, it seems like they despawn shortly after landing. So I may just use the sea fishing rod, but the jury is still out. The chest zone is coming along. I currently have one quarter filled out. This will take a couple more years to fill out completely because of all the gold and scales and wood I will need. 
but at this point I don't need a ton of chests for the items that I currently have. Checking in on the trawlers, looks like I scored a few squirt fish, so that's decent. The thing is, these fish are not as great for gold as the fish that I can grab further out into the ocean, so I'm not sure how much I'm going to actually use the trawlers. In summer, I do want to go clear the ruins again, but first, let's deal with antlion. I will send the merms in to do my dirty work and break out the popcorn from a safe distance. Once that's done, it's time for the ruins. I don't have merm guards in the cave, so I will do the clearing with my beefalo. Unfortunately, a rook followed Hutch as I made my way to the station and proceeded to bulldoze it. Coincidentally, I've decided that this might not be the best station location. If it happened once, it will probably happen again. Shadow Chester can confirm. Better to make the move now before I commit any structures. Clearing ruins with the bee flow is pretty safe. All the damage from knights, shadow creatures, and rooks will go to the bee flow, so Wirt doesn't need to heal up too much. I have flower salad in my bundle if the bee flow starts hurting, but you have enough speed to easily dodge most of the attacks anyway, and the cow will heal up on its own over time. The only thing that threatens Wirt is bishops. And that's where the bone armor comes in. Eventually, I'll have two of these so I can swap between them to negate all bishop attacks. But for now, all I have to do is back off while the armor is on cooldown, then charge back in for more damage. This is a great example of just how much benefit you get from a B-Flow. Speed plus safety is great, not to mention all the weapons, armor, and healing you will save. I'm also re-evaluating the benefit of hammering broken stations while clearing the ruins. They can potentially spawn a lot of mobs, including shadow creatures and monkeys. This one gave me four spitter spiders, and the danger plus cleanup of these situations doesn't really seem worth the two thulacite you get. So I may leave these stations alone in the future. Resetting the ruins is only going to get easier, especially once we get bright shade gear. We're also going to kill Ancient Guardian, and the loot is pretty nice. A decent mix of gems and thulacite. I will certainly use the club for the next Fuel Weaver. And that's it for year three. Next time we will visit the Moon Key Island, and Wirt is going to get some serious upgrades to her food and building resources. Then it's time for Fuel Weaver number two, and we can continue to make preparations for the rifts. Hope you enjoyed the recap, and we'll see you in the next one.